Um, my name is John Darko. I'm here to talk about affordable audio with some esteemed guests. However, two of them, well, one of them at least is running a little bit late, trying to get an Uber from another hotel. Another guy is MIA, so I do apologize for that. Um, <laughs> present and correct, we have um, Michael Lavornia from, from Stereophile, who also runs their uh, spin-off site, AudioStream, which is digital audio focused. And we have St Steve Silberman from AudioQuest, who is also a bit of a digital audio guru. Um, and it's probably a good place to start, um, I guess, with the, with the dragonfly from AudioQuest. And this is not me pimping AudioQuest gear or allowing Steve to pimp that. It's that's, that's my job. This, this, is a, this is a photo that um, I took about half an hour ago. So up on level two in the tower, there are five rooms dedicated to budget limited audio systems. So there's a $500 room, $1,000, $1,500, $2,500, $5,000. $5, to kind of give a flavor of what's possible from those different price points. Um, and I guess we'll come to vinyl in a bit. I, I promise you, I, I do want to talk about vinyl. Um, but I, I think for me, if I was putting together a system right now for a buddy who wanted to spend 500 bucks, I'd buy some, I might not necessarily buy a Dragonfly. Something like this, a small DAC that would then feed, as in this case here, a, pa a pair of uh, powered speakers. And I'd probably get something for, you know, easily 500, 500 bucks. I mean, the Dragonfly, this is the red, this is the $200 version, there, there is a $100 version. Um, st st did you want to say something about this, Steve? I, I don't want to pimp the product. Yeah, yeah, no, well, you don't have to, but I mean, in terms of it, it being, okay, so the, the reason that I've, I've singled the Dragonfly out here, I mean, I can touch, I can touch it. Is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah, please do. The, the, the whole motivation behind something like Dragonfly was, it's, it started before I even joined AudioQuest. It, Gordon and myself became enamored with USB audio. And we thought it was so cool, right? Computers, computers are, have always been a part of my life. I just, I grew up, I grew up in an era when the computer was ubiquitous, and uh, I was early to the game with things like um, Napster and iTunes, and, mm. and I, I, I knew at the time when I was using them that they were, they weren't the best sounding mm. solutions out there, but they were steps in the right direction. And then as things started to really gel, blah 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 blah, you know, USB audio became one of the prevailing connections between computers and stereo systems. <coughs> but but there, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of stuff out there that was really approachable. Hmm. And for computer audio to take, really take off, it needed to be approachable. Hmm. Well, I think where this one becomes most approachable is it's, um, what you can see here, I'm going to shout a little bit, um, this lightning adapter for iPhones. So the reason I single out that this product is because you can plug it into your computer, into your phone, whether it's Android or um, an iPhone, or your tablet. So it goes anywhere. It's very flexible. So if you're putting together a very um, affordable system, you're not hamstrung necessarily to a laptop or any particular device. I think it's more flexible. Well, I mean, <coughs> the theme being how low can you go, right? Yeah. It's, well, that's one of the questions we're asking. It's, like how it's, low? Yeah. It's, it's not just how low, it's how wide can mm -hmm. you go. And so, so many of my friends, they use a, a six or a seven plus now. That's their entire computer system. Or they have, a, they have an iPad, and that's their entire computer system. C can people hear Steve at the back or no? No, no, no it's a, sorry. Is this, we've got a volume on it? Or? How about this? Is that louder? Okay, how about now? Sorry about that. It's, it's not just about how low, but how wide you can go, is what I was saying. Yeah. And so to, to, go, to go low and to go wide, you have to have scalability, you know, which means you've got to have a fairly wide distribution, and you've got to have the, the ability to make I investments up front. Right. The reason these dragonflies can work with iPhones is because we co-developed our own microcontroller. Yeah. That met the power requirements that would allow that would allow Apple to give our product permission to connect to it. Mm -hmm. 
So there's there's a lot of upfront there's a lot of upfront investment that goes into going low and wide if you want to yeah. do something. Yeah right. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll move, I'll move on to uh, this is the uh, this is. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh okay. I'm I'm sorry. I, I, I you don't know. So this is a, no 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 no. no it's I'm not, in the hiring. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the headphone output socket of your phone. Of the iPhone, it's not too bad actually, but my MacBook, not great. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this from a fairly nerdy audiophile perspective. So what this is, is a USB DAC. So you can plug it into your MacBook, and it's got a, you can see there's a headphone lead coming out of it. So you could use that to drive a pair of headphones or connect a pair of powered speakers. So you get a better digital audio front end reaching your powered speakers, so you're not amplifying a kind of less than stellar so, yeah, source. So, any more questions about this type of product? I'll move on. So, this is the photo from the $500 um, room upstairs on level two that I took a, you know, a little while ago. We've got a, oh, damn it. That's going to keep popping up, isn't it? Um, we've got a U turn orbit turntable. I think it's about 200 bucks with a phono stage. And then we've got some uh, audio engine powered speakers. Two different kinds, they're, they're alternating between the two. Um, I don't know, like I mean, in some ways you could look, uh, many an audiophile might, I think, might listen to this and go, nah, you know, it's not really up to my standard. But I look at this and go, well, that's better than, say, a Bluetooth speaker that's this wide. Yeah, so you get nice. stereo separation. But I guess one of, I, one of my questions today is going to be, well, is it worth spending a small amount of money on a turntable? <laughs> and I know that's possibly a controversial question. <laughs> Michael Fremer would like to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I've, I've played with a whole bunch of um, entry-level-ish turntables in the last five years. Project Debut Carbon, Riga RP1, Pioneer PLX1000. Um, oh God, there's a few others as well. And I really enjoy buying records, playing records, collecting them. I love them. I do have a photo. This is my record collection. <laughs> this is it. This, is, this was uh, taken about a month ago. Um, and I, I really enjoy it. But if I, if I want to get a better sound than, say, my a $500 DAC, if I'm using a $500 turntable with it, like a $200 photo stage, I don't really feel that I'm getting a better result than my digital audio front end. I did express this a couple of, well, a few months ago online, and a certain <laughs> colleague of Michael's uh, <laughs> was, <laughs> was less than chuffed. But I'm not knocking, I'm not really, I'm not here to knock vinyl, I'm just, gonna, I'm just talking about it from a purely from a sound quality perspective. Is, I'm asking really is, is 200 bucks for a turntable just too low? If you're looking to kind of get an, a, a nice sound. Gentleman here has a point or a question, maybe. From what I understand, you can have as high end a cartridge as you want, the high end turntable as you can spend, but you'll never get more than 78 dB dynamic range out of it. Right. Is that true? Yeah, I believe it's, it's something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, then we get, I mean, the thing is, Talking in that sense, we get into a numbers game, and then it becomes a bit of a nerd war. And I'm, I'm just talking from my experience of entry-level turntables. I don't think this would give you as good a result as, say, a small DAC. That's from my experience. Michael, Michael you, you, you spin by, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, so I, uh, Audio Stream is, uh, our focus is computer-based audio. Um, and uh, Michael Fremer's focus, obviously, is vinyl. So I don't uh, review anything to do with analog, but I own a turntable and enjoy it. I've got a lot of records. I think hmm. I have more records than you do. <laughs> <laughs> but one, one, I mean, that I, one point I wanted to make that's unrelated mm. to this, yep. if you don't mind. Sure. The speakers here are from a company called Audio Engine, and they've been around for years. Mm -hmm. And they still make a model called the A2. I think now it's called the A2 Plus. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, it's a smaller... That's that one there, the white one there. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, okay. 
So many years ago, uh, we have two daughters, and many years, many years ago now, they went to college, but this was when they were younger. Um, I bought them each a pair. Uh, I bought them each a pair of A2 speakers for Christmas, and I thought it was a good idea. And, you know, my wife wasn't so sure, but they owned them. They had them in the rooms for a couple months, and at some point, we were going to have people over. I needed to do something, and I needed to borrow these speakers. So I went into my one daughter's room, and I was like, oh, you don't feel mine. I'm going to take these for a couple days. She's like, you can't take them. <laughs> and so I was like, all right. you know." So I went into our other daughter's room, and same thing. She was like, no. <laughs> you know? So in terms of my point being, mm. I think there is a, there's typically a tie-in with the notion of affordable audio with the notion of someone who's just being introduced to the hobby. Yeah. And as audio, as people who focus on this for a living or as a hobby, I think at times we lose sight of how um, life-changing a very affordable mm. um, system can be. And I think the issue is largely just one of experience. Mm. You know. So I guess... Like, what would your daughters be using to play back music had they not a pair of these A2 plus? Would they be using their, their phone? Their phone. Their right. other laptop. So I guess, yeah, if you're stepping up from the speakers on the bottom of your phone to this, <laughs> and not to the Wi-Fi connection thing again, but to this, you, that's going to be a fairly, like you say, life-changing experience. Yeah. So yeah. from an audiophile who's got like a $10,000 system, they look at this and go, nah, rubbish. Waste of time. But for somebody like like your daughters or many of my friends who do, um, even my girlfriend, she, she puts, I come home sometimes, she's got a phone on the kitchen bench and she's listening to Spotify through the phone. And it's just, it's, ho it's horrible. <laughs> it's, so, gentlemen here. I was just going to make a comment. I have a little pair of white speakers. I have, I have a pair in my office. Yeah. And I would, I would call it a gateway speaker. Right. That's, you got to start somewhere, right? Um, and it's a great speaker. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, for what they are, they're a nice little speaker. Once you get, once you get the kids hooked on something that sounds better than a cheap boombox, it's not yeah. the way. Right. Yeah, I was going to say to finish that story now. Yeah. Today, both of our daughters own Wilson speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, what I think what you're talking about there maybe maybe is relatability. You can re relate to a $200 pair of speakers right. if that's the upper end of your budget. You go, well, they're, they're, they're fantastic. And I think one of the reasons that, and I have to give Steve Gutenberg credit for this, actually, was he and I that were pushed Marjorie, the organizer of the show, into putting these rooms into the show because I, I, I said to her, like, I felt that everything sort of started at $5,000 and above, <laughs> and that, that kind of, that kind of, excludes a whole bunch of, especially people that are newcomers, yeah. they look at it and go, yeah, this is, this is great, but it's so much money. So this makes, I think, the show more relatable, more inclusive, I hope, um, even if it's not everybody's ticket in this room. You know, m many people here might have much better systems, but it's not. It's, yes, sir? I think it's a good point to bring up, as the guys were saying, that, that you know, somebody needs to have some kind of a start that's above the boom box from Walmart. Yeah. And, um, you know, if this is the kind of thing that does it, they're willing to do that, I, I think it's an excellent thing to have. I, 
And I agree with you about even the whole concept. I think this is something that sh probably should have been emphasized years ago. Well, yeah, m maybe I don't know. I would, and I understand that because uh, the other thing that you face today, a lot of people, and even even far above teenage people, when you get people even into their 30s and above, they, they couldn't come up with a fraction of the money that I've got in the home system. Right, right, yeah. So, you, I mean, everybody has to start somewhere, right? It's like your first car. Right. It's the same, I should imagine it's the same kind of thing, right? Yes, sir. I have a question for you. Go on. Dollar for dollar, can you get more sound quality out of headphones as opposed to speakers? Very good question. I would say yes. <coughs> um, because, well, for, for the first reason is you, with headphones, you're removing the, the influence of the room. But the second reason, I think you get a more, you can get a more close to the what one might term a high-end listening experience from headphones earlier on, maybe at a thousand bucks. So you can get some great headphones at a thousand dollars now, or even less, way less. You, 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 you can find great headphones for two fifty, three hundred bucks. Which headphones? Sorry, I, I've seen some stuff. You know, in the two hundred and fifty, three hundred dollar yeah. price range. That sound pretty good. You know, Sennheiser's got some stuff, and Grado's got some stuff, and so yeah. there's real accessibility with headphones. Yeah. You know, my first real hi-fi system, my own, my first real personal hi-fi system, was a Sony Walkman and a pair mm. of of um, Koss, Henry Kloss, uh headphones, and it was just, it was fantastic. It was just out of this world. It mm. was trans, it was just transformative for me. I could disappear. Right. You know, I had my, I travel with my cassettes. And my Walkman, and <laughs> that was that was the reality of 1985, 1986, 1987. Well, I think the other thing about headphones is that they can, you, you can obviously move them around your life. You're not you, you don't have to go to your listening room, or your lounge room, or your office to listen to music. You can take them wherever you want to go. Um, whereas you couldn't do that with this. I think you need to spend quite a bit more on, on loudspeakers to, if, you, if we're talking about trying to kind of go, you know, peg for peg with performance, you need to spend more on, with, on loudspeakers than you would headphones. That's my opinion. I don't know whether that's true or not. And yes, we, yes, sir. It really comes down to the physics of making the sound. When you right. take your headphones off, you hear, barely, you hear hardly anything. Yep. And that's because you've got two very small speakers driven by very low power, they're not pushing all that much air. Mm. So when you start talking about a big space that's open, you really have to shove a lot more air. And that's going to require more stuff. And I think that at you know at, at some point the cost of that extra stuff to shove that larger amount of air is just always going to cost a little bit more. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One thing that, so I spent a lot of money on my headphones or floor just because that's what I can afford. Because I, I, I can get a lot better sound for my money and I'm on the market. Yeah. But I can't share that with it. That's the big downside to the headphones because, like, I've got custom holders. Mm. I can't share that with them. I can't show them off. Right. Well, also, it's not social, is it? I mean, with this, you can sit around on a, you know, a couch and just, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's a bit easier, isn't it? Because you can go, you know, listen to this, and rather than kind of passing headphones backwards and forwards, which is a bit, I don't know, it's a bit dorky, really, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Can, can, I, can I completely change tack? Um, if anybody has any questions, comments so far, if anybody minds. Um, I'd like to talk about, well, Spotify is, I don't know, it's an example of a streaming service that doesn't stream losslessly. It streams lossy. They use the Og Vorbis codec. Uh, I wonder how many people in the room are quite happy, uh, even regularly or occasionally listening to this kind of service. Because I am, I think it's fantastic. But yeah. And some of it's terrible as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not across the board. Yeah. There is, some, there is some stuff at those levels that aren't bad. And the other thing you have to realize is once you start being in noisier environments where a lot of people are, mm -hmm. you start losing some of the resolution and stuff.
stuff like that because of the background noise. Yeah. And if you're far enough in velocity where it's not too bad, you get a pretty good result. Yeah. Steve, do you Spotify? Not as much. I used to use Spotify a lot. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I have a title account now. Yeah. But I had no problem using Spotify. For me, Spotify was a resource. I, I discovered tons of new music on there. Yeah. And then I would wind up going over to Amazon Prime and buying CDs. Does, does anybody, how many people here have a Spotify account and also a, a Tidal or a Deezer lossless account as well? So you, you kind of, some people alternate between the two or some people, I mean, personally, I think 12, how, many, how much is it here? 10 bucks a month? 10 bucks. I think it's obscenely cheap. And I don't know about you, but I think the, the free tier needs to go away. I'm not really a fan of people being able to access. Michael, how do you feel about that? People being able to access Spotify for free in exchange for hearing an ad every 10, 10 songs or so. The free tier doesn't pay the artists at all. Yeah. It's worse than, and, and streaming services in general don't pay well. So it's in the business model of every streaming service today is yet to be seen in terms of profitability. Mm. So they're they're all in a race. They're, who's going to run out of money last? Yeah. yeah. So so yeah, the free tier needs to disappear because it's not doing anyone any good, <clears throat> and it also I think helps um, reinforce this notion that music should be free. Yeah. And I don't think music should be free. I certainly wouldn't want it work for free. <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, so yeah, I mean, I I have a title Hi-Fi account, mm. and that's my sole streaming source. So you, do, you don't Spotify at all? Ever. I don't Spotify. I certainly use other resources like NPR's First Listen mm-hmm. um, is great. What they, um, prior to a, a record's release, you can listen to the entire album. Uh, it's NPR First Listen. And it's a, it's a great variety of music. It's not a single genre. Yeah. It goes across the board. So I use that. Bandcamp is really my favorite site to buy music from. And once you have an account, which you don't have to pay for, you can stream music from Bandcamp as well. So you can stream your purchases. And any and additional stuff that you oh, haven't okay. purchased. So yeah. that's a great, I love that. The, the app on the phone yeah. is really good. And yeah, it allows you to stream your collection as well. Right. So, and there's others, but yeah, yeah mainly for me listening. And the other thing I think, uh, which relates to the point you made, is what kind of listening are we doing? Mm. If I'm sitting and listening and, um, just and just doing that, then of course the quality of that experience is important. Hmm. But if I'm at a party, but I want music on in the background, the sound quality is not as important. Hmm. Yeah, you're, because you're talking and you're just enjoying things. So that's I think another aspect. And I don't, I'm not sure how many younger people have the time or even inclination to listen to music as a sole activity. Hmm. You know, I, uh, we did growing up. Yeah. And we didn't pass headphones. We listened to records and passed something else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mean the record sleeve? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Cookies. Um, I've completely lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Michael. That's yeah. <laughs> anything I can do to help? Yes. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me, because I never do this by myself, mm. unless I'm in the car or running or something like that. I mean, when people come into my office at the end of the day, we just pull the conference table back and we listen. It's always like three or four of us. Yeah. And the other point is, as far as a music source, maybe it's my age, but there are a lot of radio stations out there that are really nice to go over the web. Yeah, right. I have about 10 or 15. Yeah. Enjoy and kind of spread stuff. So I think we can all agree that, that there is an abundant, uh, uh, just a vast amount of very cheap, cheaply accessible music, or free. And what that means, I think, is that means there's more money to be spent on hardware, because back in maybe back in the vinyl age, you'd have to buy a bunch of records and then buy the hardware as well. Now music is pretty much free. So you can just start with Spotify, you get a USB DAC, powered speakers, or a DAC and an integrated amplifier and some little bookshelves or something like that to start out with, and you're not having to spend 
m very much money at all on your source material. Yeah, and you immediately, that once you plug everything in, you immediately have a library in excess of 50 million tracks. Yeah. It's, even that really, you know, it sinks in for me because when I was growing up, you'd hear music on the radio, and some of it you could buy from the local record to two guys department store that sold records, but you couldn't buy everything. Right. And you, you also had to be really careful because it was a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. really got to like that band. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yes, sorry, yes, yes, sir. So, so when does the fact, you preface this whole thing by saying non-lossless type of, of transmission. So, so lossy streaming is what we're talking right, about. Yeah. Streaming. yeah. So when, when does it become important that you have um, lossless streaming? That's a very good question. Because I guess a lot of, I mean, audio files might like to kind of tell you that, well, lossless is the only way to go which I, well, I think we can agree that's probably not the case. Spotify is great, Apple Music is great, Pandora is great. With a system like this, would this resolve the differences between the best quality Spotify and Tidal lossless? I'm not so sure. And would it be critical even if, it, if it, you think that would? My wife uses it all the time. Right. I mean, I'm a recording engineer. Right. My background, right? Yeah. Absolutely agree, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Base response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But at the same time, it's just a matter of whether people are going to be exposed to the difference between high res and lossy, and whether they make that decision in their mind that the improvement in quality is worth um, what, for many people, is a loss of convenience. Right, Steve. The <coughs> we we got to be careful not to lose sight of the world outside of our community, right? And so how low can you go? You know, what, what's, what's the significance? What's the importance of that to this world? A lot of the innovation we're, we're, we're all about to embrace is gonna come from the bottom up, right? So you look at, look at Sonos. Sonos, so, Sonos came out of nowhere. They, 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 they weren't born or spawned from this industry. They, they literally just showed up, hmm. was it 2003, 2002? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they built hardware, and they built software, and they built interface. And it's just now you're seeing a multitude of companies mm -hmm. in our world catching up to them in terms of just the interface. Mm -hmm. you know, 
put put Sonics aside, which which by the way the Sono stuff can sound really good. If if you're living in a world where c- CD resolution is plenty good enough for you, mm-hmm. a Sonos Connect as as a streaming endpoint connected to a DAC can be right up there with some of the best sounding gear you've ever heard. But the importance of it really is is the influence Sonos has had. Right? It's it's nobody knows how big they are, but everybody estimates they're they're north of a billion dollars a year in sales. And so they have access to a ton of customers. And when they tell people, you should give Deezer Hi-Fi a try, or you should try Tidal in, in Lossless, they have a greater capability of influence than we do. They're reaching a wi- much wider audience than, than we could ever possibly reach. Right. So there's, there's an importance to things like Sonos. And a- another, another case in point, too, is, is anybody here bought an Amazon Echo? No one here has bought an Amazon Echo. Interesting. It's the, the new graphic user interface won't be graphic. It's going to be. Can you explain what to, what it is? Because yeah. I, I'm not fully across it. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, they, they don't sell it in penal colonies. Very <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. So. Amazon, Amazon, a few years, I don't know if it's been a year or two years now, but they mm-hmm. released they released a circular, a cylindrical speaker. And uh, when they first introduced it, they, they did this big mass email mailing to all of their Amazon Prime customers talking about this voice-activated stereo system that they'd be selling. And, they, and they, they sort of crowdfunded it. They sold it for $99 for early adopters, and now it sells for $199. And what Amazon Echo does is it connects to your network, and it ties into your Amazon account, and you talk to it. You tell it what you would like to listen to, and it finds your music for you. And so that, what we saw, say, with Sonos and the impact that they had or the impact that iTunes had mm-hmm. in terms of the graphic user experience, we're going to have another impact like that with voice activated. Mm-hmm. So yes, you, Sonos announced, sorry, that they're yeah. going in that direction as well. Yeah, so, so what, what Amazon has done is they've opened up the API to their to their Echo system, and so you're going to see people like Sonos now. Sonos is going to integrate Amazon's Echo API into their system, and I would I would I would bet that within the next five or six years, it becomes pretty common here at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, where there'll be streaming DAX, you know, the kind of stuff we want to buy, and it'd be it'd be voice command as well as graphic right. user interface command. So I guess we're going to expect Sonos to be the first out of the gate with that in in, in our little sort of like get up. Yeah, yeah, prob- right. probably, probably. But there's all this amazing innovation to be to be found in these things that that people in our community may, may be dismissive of. How many people here own a Sonos? Anything? Okay, a decent amount of people. Yeah, but no Amazon Echo, right. which, which would be interesting next year. It'd be interesting. One guy does back there. It'd be interesting to ask yeah. next year who's got an Amazon Echo. Anybody here? Well, that's a subjective thing, and see, that's the, well, no, and that's 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 part of what that's part of what somewhat turns people off from wanting to come into our community, being told that you haven't you haven't been good enough in the past, you haven't deserved your music. People get high on music through all kinds of different pieces of hardware. Is anybody here? Did anybody here own a Walkman in high school? And did anybody sit there and complain to themselves and go, "Geez, I wish my Walkman was better." <coughs> No, you got. You just love the music. You just really love the music, and people really got high on that. So the accessibility. One of the importance of this: how low can you go, mm. and how wide can you go, is the accessibility for right. people. One more thing: if, if you're talking about the Amazon Echo ecosystem, you've got the Echo Dot, which apparently is it's connected, it's connected to any uh, system that you have. It's kind of like a, I mean, I imagine it's lossy. Yeah, it's lossy. It's it, it's infant stages right now. Yeah. You you wrote a review on the Chrome. The, yeah, the Google Chromecast audio, the little disc. No, they're they're actually. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, Steve was asking me what. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah it's Google Home, and it's actually going to be a direct competitor. Right. You, 
you mentioned the Chromecast. Well, yeah, you, you, you wrote a review of the Chromecast, and were you able to I get did. good fidelity out of that? So, uh, do you, know, you guys know what the Chromecast audio is? Yeah. 35 bucks, and it's got a hybrid output port that can do Toslink and analog three and a half mil. Now, I guess when I'm reviewing something, I'm, kind of, I'm not really reviewing it from the, 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 the kind of average guy in the street point of view. I'm reviewing it from an audiophile perspective. I didn't really rate the sound, either digitally or analog. But what really bugs me more than it, I could, you can forgive the sound quality, but one of the things that really got my goat was the, and this is something that you see quite a bit, and we shouldn't, is the lack of gapless playback. So Tidal on a Google Chromecast audio, there's gaps in between the tracks. Same with Spotify, actually, but not quite as pronounced. And it's one of my hot button issues is, you know, records were gapless, then CDs were gapless, and then we, we're kind of into this digital audio age and we're stepping backwards in some areas. And it's not just the Chromecast audio, it's like the WLA Phantom speakers, their little dialogue router box that has the tidal control inside, that's not gapless either. Um, what else? The Oppo 105. Anybody got one of those? It doesn't do gapless over network streaming, does it? So, I don't know why I've gone down this path, but I kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, I'll get, explain what gapless means. Yes. Yeah. So if you're playing like a, a live album or... A, the, cl the, the classic one to mention is Dark Side of the Moon. I think everybody knows that record here. Um, when you play it with the transition between, say, track one and track two, it should be smooth and seamless, right? Yeah. It's not. So if you listen on Google Chromecast Audio, you get a split second of silence between every track. Now I listen to a lot of DJ mix albums, so I cut. The, they're just they're out. They're off the menu, which I think is, you know, pretty poor. I think Gapless should be on absolutely everything, or don't you know, don't do it at all. But it's not. You know, you have to buy the thing to find out that it's not there. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to chat. They're going, well, this thing doesn't do gapless. It's amazing, you know. But I think it's, um, Michael, do you think gapless is, is important? Or am I just getting my, I don't know, getting, getting worked up over nothing? <laughs> well, I, I agree with your point that why, um, why does this exist mm. to begin with? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's part of a larger issue with digital. Um, there was a, there was a very big promise in, in terms of sound quality yep. that took, in my opinion, decades to deliver. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, and the the move to computer based audio um, also promises a lot. Yep. and when you you're all excited with your, your your music library and you open it up and half of the album covers aren't there. That's another silly thing that should never have happened. Mm. You know, it's like going in the record store buying an LP, and it's like, where's the cover? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> really, you know, we, these things we shouldn't. It should be um, it just happened, but they mm. didn't. And it's just odd that there are these weird little cracks in digital's perfect skin. So yeah, so even though it's it's very affordable, so streaming service is very affordable. I mean. Uh, yeah, I guess. Well, sp I think Spotify and Tidal are very good with cover art. Oh, no, I'm talking about your own personal library. Right, so yeah. when you do CD rips and things like that, you have to spend... I spend a long time kind of editing all the, the tags in my audio. Um, Eno, who uh, would be here normally, who works for Rune, laughs at me. because why do you spend so much time doing that? So it's because when I move my files into different software applications, I get my cover art and my album titles are mm -hmm. correct. And yeah, people might call me you know, retentive, but at least it, everything I works. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, I just wanted to kind of, I live in the software world, I write software for a living. Right. And those cracks that you're mentioning, it's actually kind of funny seeing the consumer side of some of those cracks because as programmers, sometimes that's just stuff that we miss. Sometimes that's stuff that's actually really hard to do in a digital format. For example, Gap. Yeah. With gap, with, when you're playing music, you're playing five. When you're playing a CD, you have a continuous stream of music. Yes, music. it's one, essentially one file, isn't it? Right. On a disc. Each yeah. song is one file. So yeah. the gaps are whatever device loading the next file. Mm. And those that do gapless, I 
actually, like, um, I know tidal. When you've got a tidal going, as you're nearing the end of a track, they actually start preloading the next track. Yeah. 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 But that's yeah. not easy. No, I'm not saying it's easy, but I, I'm I saying. But some of these things that are these cracks in digital audio, it's, it's kind of interesting to look kind of behind the curtain mm. because some of them are actual technical limitations of the format that are things that are easy to do in the format. Right. So, I mean, even yeah, back in. Sure my Blackberry did it seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, but some of that comes down to how much you pay for your device. That Blackberry is an expensive device. That Chromecast audio that doesn't have Gap or Playback is 35 bucks. Sure. So that Chromecast audio may not have the memory to do Gap. It might not, but I guess my, my beef was that because it's Tidal, it's Tidal's hi fi service, and they tout it as CD quality. For me, CD quality is yes, one is lossless. 1644 audio, but CD quality is also gapless playback, and like in, a CD. In, in a lot of situations, I, live, I know on my, I listen to title a lot on my phone. Mm. That's actually my primary playback device, and I've got all the gadgetry to hook it in my DAC, my app, and all of that. And if you're playing it directly on Android, it is gapless, unless right. you change tracks. Like if, if you skip to a different track that it's not prepared for, it has a gap. But if, if you're playing just a consistent through playlist, yeah. it is gaps. Okay. Um, I want to change tack again completely. I'd like to talk about Bluetooth. Oh. Oh. And the reason I want to talk about Bluetooth is because Apple have moved the conversation on fairly recently and their ear pods are Bluetooth connected to the phone. Are they the ear pods? They're not for sale yet, are they? No. Mm. Right. But I've, I've been having an interesting time ex experiencing Bluetooth headphones and streaming to boxes at home. Now, the, the, when I mention Bluetooth in front of audio files, I think a lot of people go, well, it's, it's garbage, it's rubbish. But I often think that's more tied to the hardware experience. So often Bluetooth is associated with tiny little speakers with no stereo, with no dynamics. Whereas Bluetooth can be quite good. But what I wanted to kind of talk about here, I'm, I'm gonna draw on Steve's expertise because he knows more than I do about Bluetooth, is this. So, these headphones, I just pulled this picture up the net. You'll notice this logo here, Aptics. Now, I'd never heard of Aptics until I started shopping for kind of Bluetooth devices. Um, should I explain or do you want to explain what, what Aptics is? Go for it. Okay, I'll, I'll give them my best shot. So on a Bluetooth connection, and I know we've got a, actually another Bluetooth expert in the audience here, so I've got to be very careful. On a Bluetooth connection, the, the, there's a, the transmission between the sender, you say your phone, and the receiver, um, the headphones, is determined by a codec. So that codec must be common to both devices. So the standard, so the Bluetooth spec includes a standard codec that every single transmitter and receiver must talk, and that's called SBC. But Aptex is not. It's, it's touted by the, the company that owns it, Qualcomm, as a higher quality Bluetooth experience. But there's a catch. I don't know whether many people are aware of it. I, I, I certainly wasn't. Is that you need to have, like I said, the codec needs to exist on both, say, your phone and the headphones to engage an Aptex conversation between two devices. Now that's great. So you kind of buy these headphones thinking, I'm getting a super awesome Bluetooth experience because Aptex is promising that. But I need to make sure that my phone also <coughs> has Aptex. And guess what? No iPhone or iPad has Aptex capabilities. Now that's not to say you can't get great Bluetooth from an iPhone or iPad because the iPhone uses AAC or can use AAC if it's not using SBC. But there aren't many headphones that support AAC. So what, what does all this mean for me, the consumer? So if I listen, I've got a pair, of not this particular pair of headphones, I've got some Sennheiser, Momentum wireless Bluetooth headphones that I use on the plane. And if I use my Windows phone as a source, with Tidal or Spotify, that engages an Aptex conversation with my headphones. And for me, it sounds better than using my iPhone, which is only conversing with my headphones using SBC. So my experience is Aptex sounds better. Now I know that Steve wants to say something, probably wants to say something here, because you think that maybe I've misjudged this or. I just, I'm just, I don't like to draw um, 
singular conclusions. You, mm -hmm. you, you, made, you made a, a million different changes, changing from one phone to the next. There's, yeah. there's all these other variabilities yeah. that can play into it. I want to let me let's just step back a little bit. Let's talk about Bluetooth and how yeah. talk about a little bit more how it works. So, Bluetooth. Everyone, anyone here not not using Bluetooth? Right, everyone's using Bluetooth. It's pretty, it's ubiquitous at this point. So the way that it works is you've got your hardware, right, and then you have your core specification that sits on top of the hardware. So think of the core specification as like your operating system, right, and then and then you have. Um, um, the protocols that are used. So, um, say right now, probably the most popular thing is A2DP uh, in terms of the transmission back and forth. And then you have codecs. And what you're talking about is a codec. Yep. So, Aptex is a codec, no different than AAC or MP3 or SBC are codecs. It's just a codec. Yep. And it's a high compression codec, just like the other codecs out there. And it's up for debate which codec sounds. <laughs> Sure, but I'm just relaying my experience. Better or not, yeah. yeah. What, what's really going on here, the real end game of all of these codecs is it's, it's a land grab. There are royalties associated with all the different codecs. It's 75 cents per device for MP3. It's 75 or 79 cents for AAC. You can't find what a Aptex is, a royalty is until you sign a non-disclosure or something. Right. I can't find it anywhere. But it's, it, it, it's... That's what it really comes down to. Is what that's what these codecs are really about. But the thing is, 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 Aptex is being it's being touted as being put on a box as if it's a format. Right. It's not a format. Um, but it's I, just a codec. I think what I'm driving at here is that even for this single pair of headphones, your experience with your phone might be different to my experience with my phone. So Bluetooth is not un it's not uniform in its quality. There are more important things. So we've been developing a Bluetooth platform for a few years. <coughs> we're we're going to we're going to release in the not too distant future a, a DAC that does among other things. It does Bluetooth, but but we we approached it from a different perspective. When you, when you if you if you go through, you can come to the market. You can come to market real quickly with a Bluetooth device if you want to, because you can buy sort of what you would call a turnkey solution. You can get a chip that essentially does, or a, a set of chips that essentially do everything that you want to do to get sound out. <coughs> off the airwaves and through the product to, the, to your DAC and to your analog stage. But there's a lot of limitations yeah. to doing things that way from our perspective. They're, they're, they're limited in terms of their processing power. They, they're categorically not upgradable. Um, the, the hardware itself, there's really no optimizations you can do to it yeah. other than you know, trying to put the best power supply into it. So we just approach it from a different perspective. But, but the point, my point being that, 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 that in, in the grand scheme of things, the, the, the codec is not as consequential as it's being touted. There's, 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 there's bigger fish to be fried out there. Sure. In terms of getting Bluetooth to sound good. So does Bluetooth have a place in the sort of entry level audiophile world, or is it, is it not quite there yet in terms of quality? What do you think, Michael? You I'm a fan. You're a fan. Bluetooth. Yeah, and largely <coughs> because I view it as um, I've said, um, friend and family friendly. Mm -hmm. yes. If you have a Bluetooth um, enabled, let's say, some integrated amp, yeah. and you have friends come over and they have music on their phone, they can just play their music through your system. Yeah, without authenticating with your Wi-Fi and yeah, so yeah. And that is, uh, to me, that's a, again, it's like just a very, it's a human factor. To yeah. It. Sound quality aside, yeah. and in those instances, again, back to the, the point I was making earlier, it's what kind of listening are you doing? You know, we're not. We're, it almost seems like when you say Bluetooth to a to an audiophile audience, a lot of people act like you're trying to take away all my other stuff. <laughs> my, oh my God! Oh, Bluetooth! You're gonna be. I'm gonna be. I'm not gonna be able to use cables anymore. I know it's like it's just another option. Mm. And if you if you have that option, you know, like in a in device like the PS Audio Sprout or something, um, it's just an option. Mm. You know, it's like. It would be like getting angry over having a toss link input. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah. just there. It's not going to hurt anyone. <laughs> it's, not <laughs> it's not taking away from your loss of streaming or your vinyl experience. It's just another. It's a nice feature. Yeah. yeah. I, I, convenience. And, and I agree with your, your family friendly mm. side of it, but there's also the power side of it. You know, people are very conscientious mm. of, of battery life on their phones, and Bluetooth mm. it re uses relatively low amount of power. Yeah. You know, I'm. 
you can make Bluetooth sound enjoyable. Right? There's a lot of opportunity mm. to make Bluetooth sound enjoyable, and we're going to see Bluetooth go through a maturation process. You're going to see better hardware available. Uh, you're going to see the core specifications continue to evolve. Yeah. Um, there is a guy here in, in the audience who is genuinely a Bluetooth expert, and he's, he's a software architect in the Bluetooth arena. How, how far are we away from a, a core specification allowing for lossless over, over Bluetooth? Let me give you a mic because then people can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to come? You, you're welcome to come oh, sit out here. <laughs> um, like I said, there, there, there's a group within the SIG that is actually focused on um, moving the, the audio profiles forward the, and the basic architecture of uh, audio. Um, starting with the, the lower levels, the streaming, the, the architecture that because they've split a lot between things like uh, HFP, the different profiles, HFP, A2DP, and people were just like, well, why don't we just like make it one solid and make it a good quality transport? So that's what their current um, project is now. And on top of that will, again, come things like uh, what we have now in HTTP, which would be the codex that we're, they're discussing now. and. Um, Really but any idea, any idea as well as like phone audio and things like that. I'm sorry. Sorry, I was asking about the, any idea how long until we see lossless audio being be, being piped across the connection. Um, they're currently still working out the the architecture, so I mm. wouldn't say within the year. Um, within, within a year? No, no. Within I say I would not say within the year. Okay, no. Okay. So. Um, um, there is bandwidth issues, uh, but it's really just a, a really just metal. It'll it'll be a new specification, right? It'll it, it's like I say it's a it's a brand new audio architecture that they're working out. Um, they've actually tried to do this before, uh, but they couldn't get buy-in from the industry, so it just kind of died on the vine. Um, but now they've got quite a few different companies that are actually pushing it. So um, bigger name companies that. So I, I think it's going to happen. I just it's just they argue a lot in this group. <laughs> hard, hard to believe, I know, but it's, it's true. Uh, so um, the the progress has been slow. So. Okay, I'm I'm going to end on one thing. So I'm going to come back to my. I mean, it's not really. I'm, I'm trying to pimp my my, my record collection. Um, just can you give me a second? Five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm in the process of moving from Australia to Germany. So I've left Australia now, I'm in, I'm in Denver now, and I'm off to Germany in a couple of weeks. So I had to put this lot into storage um, down in Melbourne with a buddy for a, I don't know how long. But before I, I boxed it all up into flight cases, I scanned the whole lot into Discogs for insurance purposes. And Discogs told me that the, the lowest probable value of my collection was like $12,000, the highest was $25,000. Now, when you're buying records like bit by bit, one by one, you don't really notice the money. But when I, st I stared at these numbers and went, wow, I could have bought myself an absolute, I could have bought a DCS DAC for that money. <laughs> so I guess what I'm, I'm questioning here is, and I, I know I was talking earlier on about entry level turntables not, in my experience, not sounding that great. And vinyl, relative to streaming services, because streaming has really made records look extremely expensive. 30 bucks a pop, that's 20 bucks a pop, I don't know, even used is, fu is you know, that's one month of Tidal. So I I'm wondering, does it have a place, does, do record players and vinyl playback have a place in entry level audio? Now I know, I'm pretty sure you can find Mr. Fremer again in a moment, but I wonder, I wonder what the audience thought, whether, I mean, 500 records at 30 bucks a go, that's, one is renting and one is buying. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, yes, for sure. Yes, sir. But I, I know uh, some people, uh, you know, that are, are collecting records, and one of the sources they go to is these these stores around who have records they're traded, they're used. Yeah. And they're happy to get them. You can get them a few bucks a piece, you know, and if it makes them happy, good. Oh, I'm not. I'm not knocking. I'm not saying that nobody yeah. should do it. I'm just saying, does it have a place if you've got a thousand dollars to spend on an entry level system? 
would you get a turntable and then probably not uh, new records but i can yeah. say some people would be happy to go for some of the used stuff yeah well it's just it's just food for thought it just made me yeah. think you know, it actually made me regret buying all those records, thinking, well, I'm not going to see them for a few years, and there's a lot of money tied up. And it, yeah, maybe, yeah, think about it again. This is being recorded, so I'll play it for Mikey. You couldn't be like <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully before we leave, so yeah. he can talk to you. I, I've okay. seen him already this morning. <laughs> um, doesn't, it, doesn't it sort of depend on, on the, you, the owner of the record and whether or not they believe the sound quality is superior in some way to other sources. Sure. But, okay, well, in my experience, I don't think it is superior. I think a $500 turntable and phono stage, in the main, sounds inferior to that same money spent on a, on a computer audio front end. That's my experience. Now, I know that there are others who will, who will disagree. But once you've got that, coupled to the fact that records are so expensive, I know and a lot of the affordable audio rooms upstairs have turntables in them, I'm not so sure that's, I mean they look nice and everybody has a romantic association with them, not everybody, but some people do, um, and that's great, but I'm wondering if that's sending the wrong message. It's just a question. <laughs> yes, sir? I know people are tired of hearing from me, but not at all. We, we buy audio systems to fulfill our desires of uh, connecting with music, yeah. and if the, it, it's, a, it's important to know the person that you're trying to evangelize. If you're buying something sure. for yourself, know yourself. Yeah. But if the person that you're trying to get into audio is into kind of the, the romantic uh, characteristics of vinyl, or if you sort of broach the subject to them uh, and they, they sound interested in the vinyl route, then yeah, there's an option for them. But yeah. For the person who oh. already uses Spotify, or you know, they probably already use Spotify on their phone. Absolutely. It's a shorter path. Yeah, but I'm just saying that there's a financial opportunity cost to pay. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you want to set 500 bucks aside of your thousand dollar budget, you might set that aside for records. Well, that the digital audio guy will go, well, I can just put more of my money into my DAC and stream from Spotify, or Tidal, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think we need to wrap it up. Is that am I right? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll wrap it up. Um, guys, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and thank you to the panel as well. Yeah.